Hello, welcome to St Andrews. We're continuing with our series on the book of Ruth. And last week we left Ruth and her mother-in-law Naomi in a very vulnerable and desperate situation. Two poor widows returned to Naomi's hometown of Bethlehem with no adequate means of supporting themselves. They seek refuge in the Lord and the Lord provides for them in remarkable ways. God's power is displayed not through miracles, but through his invisible hand of providence. Our theme today is taking refuge in the Lord and our key verse is Ruth 2 verse 12. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your care and concern for all people. We thank you for your great love for us. And we acknowledge that you are always working in our lives, not always through miracles, but uh, usually through your invisible hand of providence. We pray, Lord, that we will uh, continually seek to bring our lives into line with your will, knowing that you have a good, pleasing and perfect plan for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading is Ruth 2, verses 1 to 18, and Mark is going to read that for us. Ruth meets Boaz in the grain field. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I find favour. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, Who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, and whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from, from the water jars the men have filled. At this she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, Why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people who you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favour in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks from her, for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over from what she had eaten after she had eaten enough. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When that little girl who went missing recently, Cleo Smith, 
uh, was found alive and well, a number of people said to me how relieved they were. It was a horrendous story. A vulnerable little girl snatched from her parents in the middle of the night. We thank God that she was found. And it reminds me of something that happened when I was a police chaplain in London. The uh, officers that I was with were called to a supermarket and a very distraught mother who had lost one of her children, uh, a three-year-old boy. CCTV footage confirmed that he'd wandered out onto a busy street in a very rough part of London, uh, an area with especially high levels of social deprivation and a, a high prevalence of mental ill health. That little boy was extremely vulnerable and in considerable danger. I tried to comfort the mother. I prayed with her. And that boy was missing for over an hour and a half. Eventually, he was found uh, near his home, which was about a kilometer and a half away. I've never been so thankful to God. I can't imagine how that mother must have felt. She certainly looked relieved, I can tell you. A three-year-old boy walking those streets at night. It's hard to imagine a more vulnerable figure. But I want to use that as a picture because many people are walking through life extremely vulnerable. There are millions and millions of vulnerable people in the world. Actually, we're all vulnerable. All that varies is the extent. But those who are most vulnerable include children, the elderly, refugees, the homeless, the poor. The most dangerous country in the world for women is the Democratic Republic of Congo. All females in that country and many other places are extremely vulnerable. Many vulnerable people do not have a safe place to take refuge, or they're not aware of one. Uh, so they seek refuge in places that are far from safe. I think of a poor single mother cohabiting with a violent, abusive partner because she can't see any way out, living in fear, not knowing where to go or who to turn to. There are vulnerable people everywhere, not just talking about people living in Afghanistan or Yemen or Somalia. I'm talking about people right here in Springfield. This is entirely relevant for us. Well, today we're going to hear about a vulnerable woman called Ruth and her equally vulnerable mother-in-law, Naomi. And we're going to see God's heart for them and God's heart for all vulnerable people. But let's uh, start by recapping the story so far because we we're looking at this last week. So uh, the book of Ruth is set during the time of the judges, uh, which was a time of dissipation and great moral decline. Uh, the nation of Israel was in a total mess. And the land was hit by a famine. And then we hear about this man called Elimelech. Um, and in order to avoid the famine, he moved his family from uh, Bethlehem in Judah, away from God's presence and God's purpose. And he moved his family to Moab, which was uh, a vile, wicked kingdom where people worship the demon god Chemosh. In moving his family from Bethlehem to Moab, Elimelech was effectively turning his back on the one true God of Israel and seeking refuge among the pagans. The family moved to Moab to preserve their lives, and in Moab, they found only death. Elimelech died early on, and then in two sons, Mahlon and Kilion, who both married Moabite women, they died as well. Uh, and that leaves three vulnerable widows. Elimelech's wife, Naomi, and his two, her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. So Naomi realizing, realizes that uh, moving to Moab was a really bad idea, and she resolves to return to Bethlehem in Judah. But this is not just a physical return to Bethlehem. This is also a spiritual return to God. Uh, Naomi is, in effect, repenting. She's turning around. She's going back to God. Uh, one of her daughters-in-law, Orpah, returns to her family, which seems like the safe option. But actually, in seeking refuge with her family, she was also seeking refuge in her family's gods. 
and that's made clear by the passage. Uh, Ruth, on the other hand, shows great loyalty and a sense of responsibility for her mother-in-law. Uh, Ruth loves Naomi. Uh, this is what she says, and there's a, a slide. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. So not only is Ruth incredibly loyal, but it seems that she's had some kind of conversion experience. She, she turned her back on Moab, on, on the god Chemosh, and she sought refuge in the one true God of Israel. But in so doing, humanly speaking, she put herself in a very vulnerable position. But the key thing from last week is this. In amongst all this tragedy and uncertainty, God is working by his invisible hand of providence to bring great blessing to Naomi and Ruth. God is working behind the scenes, if you like. But as is so often the case, they can't see it. They'll come to know it later on, but when their situation was most dire, when their uh, circumstances were most desperate, they couldn't see what God was doing in their lives. In fact, Naomi was convinced that God had afflicted her, and she renamed herself. Her, her name, Naomi, means sweet. She, she named herself Mara, which means bitter. We haven't used our name tags for a while, but if we were still using our name tags and Naomi visited us here at church, she, she'd get the pen and she'd write bitter on the name tag with an upside-down smiley face. You'd take one look at her, and you would know that something was wrong. So that's where we got to last week. Naomi is bitter. She's heartbroken. She's angry with God. So Naomi and Ruth are back in Bethlehem, and they're completely destitute. They've got nothing. So Ruth goes out gleaning in the fields. Gleaning was the ancient equivalent of food bank or some kind of welfare system. So landowners were not supposed to harvest right to the very edges of their fields, uh, you know, to get every last stalk of wheat or barley. They're supposed to leave uh, some of the harvest in the, uh, along the edges and in the corners so that the poor could come and help themselves, so that they'd have something uh, to feed their families with. The practice is mentioned quite a lot in the Old Testament. For example, Deuteronomy 24.19 says this. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. There is a lot of provision for the poor and the vulnerable in Old Testament law. And with this example, it's worth noting that Ruth qualified on all three counts. She was a foreigner, she was to all intents and purposes uh, fatherless, and she was a widow. So Ruth went gleaning, and in verse 3 it says, So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Now, we might not pick up on this, but this is a bit of Hebrew humor. As it turned out, or... It just so happened that this was Boaz's field. This is tipping us the wink that God is working behind the scenes to bring this situation about. Have you ever met someone at just the right time in your life? Uh, maybe you were going through a really tough time. And it just so happens that you met a Christian who reached out to you, who prayed with you who invited you to church. Was that coincidence? Or was that God's providence? Well, the book of Ruth would tell us that that was probably God's providence. And actually, God does this sort of thing all the time. Uh, Mangus and Astralita moved here from South Africa, and they wanted confirmation that this was the right church. And it just so happens that when they came to St. Andrews, they met Trevor. Now, they didn't know Trevor before, but Trevor had previously been a member of the church where Mangus and Astralita went to in South Africa. And there was a lady at that church who said, when you get to Brisbane, you must look up Trevor Adams. 
And they thought, yeah, right. <laughs> like we're going to find uh, one man with nothing but his name to go on. They didn't have an email or phone number or anything. And it just so happens that when they came to this church for the first time, they met Trevor Adams. Was that coincidence? Or was that God's providence? God does this sort of thing all the time. And we're going to hear that testimony in full, I hope, uh, at some point. We'll get them to share the, the whole testimony. It's wonderful. Uh, so Ruth just happened to be gleaning in the field of a landowner named Boaz. Boaz was wealthy, he was of noble standing, and most importantly, he's just a really good, godly man. The first thing he says in this story, he's addressing his employees, the harvesters, and he says, the Lord be with you. That's his greeting. And the harvesters respond, the Lord bless you. How many of you have a boss at work who, when he sees you in the morning, pronounces a blessing over you? This was a very different uh, work environment. At the time, uh, many, if not most people in Israel, had turned their backs on God. They were worshipping idols. And here we see this landowner, this boss, greeting his employees with a blessing. Not only that, but the overseer was allowing people to glean in the field, allowing a foreigner to glean, which shows that God's laws were being upheld. Boaz didn't have to instruct his overseer. The overseer knew, the harvesters knew what kind of outfit Boaz was running. If you own a business or you're in a management position, what kind of culture do you want to create? A worldly culture or a godly culture? You know, in your place of work, especially if you have some position of authority, you might be the closest thing your employees or colleagues have to a pastor. In your place of work, you might be the closest thing that your employees or colleagues have to a pastor. That's really worth thinking about. That's quite a responsibility. If you've not been praying for God's guidance to help you make the most of this opportunity, start praying. Who knows how God will use you in that workplace. So Boaz was a godly man who had created a godly culture in his company. Actually, Boaz is uh, what we call a type of Christ. The word type has a very specific meaning. Um, it denotes someone who shows us a faint outline of Christ, someone who points forwards to Christ. In many ways, Boaz has the heart of God and the character of Christ. He's not perfect, he's just a human being, but he can give us some indication of what we can expect to see in Jesus. And if Boaz is a, is a type of Christ, then Ruth is a type of Christ's church, uh, sorry, Christ's bride, the church. So now you can see where this uh, Ruth Boaz thing is going. So it's a bit of a spoiler, but you probably knew anyway. And as for uh, and the, and uh, so this narrative gives us an indication of what it means for the church to take refuge in Christ, for the church to be redeemed by Christ, and we'll look at that a bit later. And for us as individuals, it gives us an indication of what it means for a vulnerable person to seek refuge in Christ. And, and let's remember that uh, we are all vulnerable to some extent. What does it mean for us as vulnerable people to seek refuge in Christ. You know, Boaz is a safe man for a vulnerable person to be around. And we want to be safe people for vulnerable people to be around. So he comes into the field and he sees Ruth working away and he notices her and he says, who does that woman belong to? And that doesn't sound very complimentary to modern ears, but really what he's saying is, who's looking out for that person? Who's looking after this vulnerable person? And the overseer explains she's a Moabite widow. Uh, she came back with Naomi, and she'd been working super hard. Now, imagine if Boaz had been unscrupulous. Uh, here's a, a, a single woman, broke, homeless, vulnerable, gleaning in the field, completely dependent on Boaz and his generosity. 
There are plenty of men whom, if they thought they could get away with it, they would take advantage of that situation, take advantage of Ruth. I'm not talking 3,000 years ago, even today. Power and impunity are a dangerous combination. In other words, when someone is in a position of power and they can abuse that power without any repercussions. A friend of mine was um, serving in Sierra Leone. He was in a covert observation post, so he couldn't leave his position. And he saw a little boy, maybe about nine years old, walking down the road with a huge fish, looking pleased as punch. And a man approached the boy, no one else around, tried to take the fish. The boy resisted, and the man just punched him full force in the face, knocked him down, took the fish. Power combined with impunity. Think about Nazi prison guards in the Second World War. And the appalling things they did, I, I think of that scene from Schindler's List, where you've got the camp commandant sitting on a chair, leaning out the window with a sniper's rifle, taking pot shots at prisoners as they move around the compound, and then they all start running in panic. Power combined with impunity. Think of the very wealthy people who have hit the headlines for sexually abusing minors, Jeffrey Epstein, R. Kelly, and many others. Power combined with impunity, impunity, or at least the perception of impunity. They thought they could get away with it. It's a dangerous thing, and it leads to vulnerable people being badly mistreated. In that situation, in that culture, remember that Ruth was a foreigner, a despised Moabite. She's gleaning in Boaz's field. He's a wealthy landowner. Boaz had power and impunity, but he was completely honorable. He approaches Ruth, and his first words are, my daughter, my daughter. It's like he's reflecting the father heart of God. And here's what he says. He said, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the women. I've told the men not to lay a hand on you, and whenever you are thirsty, go and drink Uh, Go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. So his first instinct is to protect. His first instinct is to protect Ruth. He says, don't go and work in the other fields. They've got a different way of working. That's not going to be a safe environment for you over there. Stay close to the women who work for me. They'll look after you. You 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 you, you. You can make friends with them. I've told the men not to harm or harass you in any way, and as a Moabite woman, uh, she would have been much more susceptible to that. And he says, drink water from the jars that the men have filled. Whenever you need a drink, just go and get one. He's basically saying, look, you're going to be safe here. You're going to be okay here. Do you see how God is working through Boaz? I think God would say to, 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 to Ruth, stay here, Ruth, stay with me. Don't go to any other gods. Don't go chasing after that god, Chemosh. And incidentally, uh, Chemosh most likely means destroyer. It doesn't sound like a very safe place to take refuge, does it, with the destroyer. But the, the important thing to see here is that it is God who protects Ruth through Boaz, who is a type of Christ. And I think God would say to us, And to you, especially if you're in a vulnerable situation, he'd say, stay close to me. Stay close to my people. I want to protect you. Don't seek refuge in your career or in your financial status or in romantic relationships or new age beliefs or Buddhism or anything else. Seek refuge in the Lord. Put your hope and your trust in the Lord. And then the conversation continues, and the next thing is uh, Boaz prays for Ruth. I don't know whether you noticed when we read the passage. He prays for her. He's a great man, isn't he? He's strong enough to maintain discipline amongst his employees, but he's tender enough that he wants to pray for Ruth. And here's what he prays. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. He's talking about what she's done for Naomi. That's the reason that Boaz is so impressed by Naomi, because sorry, by Ruth, because she's been so uh, diligent in looking after her mother-in-law and so hardworking. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. 
May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So Boaz recognizes that he can offer Ruth some protection, but ultimately it's the Lord in whom she is seeking refuge. So Boaz seeks to protect Ruth. He cares enough about her to pray for her. And the next thing we see, he's generous towards her. He invites her to come and eat with the harvesters, and he tells Ruth that she can gather from among the sheaves, which is as good as saying, just just help yourself. Just take whatever you need. That's like someone owning a grocery store, and let's say there's a homeless person who passes by regularly, and that uh, store owner says to that homeless person, look, come in, here's a basket, just take whatever you want. And whenever you come, whenever you come past, you know, come in the store, take whatever you want. I'll tell the cashiers that you don't have to pay for it. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to do? So Ruth uh, returns home to Naomi, and she's got an ephah of barley, which is about 35 liters of barley. That's a big old sack of barley. And Naomi asks, well, where did you get that? And Ruth explains that she's been gleaning in Boaz's field. Now Naomi gets really excited because uh, Boaz is actually a relative and their guardian redeemer. Their guardian redeemer. In Hebrew culture, if a man uh, died leaving uh, a wife, children, land, then uh, a close relative would have the obligation of making sure that they were cared for. Um, Usually that would mean purchasing the land, if there was any, marrying the widow, raising the children. So now bitter Naomi, who thought that God had afflicted her, is beginning to see that maybe God has been working out his purposes all along. Now she advises Ruth to dress in her best clothes and go and lie down at Boaz's feet as he sleeps on the threshing floor. Now we're going to look at this a bit more next week uh, because that sounds like a dodgy strategy, doesn't it? (laughs) I mean... How many of us would give that advice to our daughters? You know, dress up nice, put on some perfume, and go and lie at this guy's feet while he's sleeping. I I hope that none of us would would give that advice. It seems a bit dodgy, and I think it is, and it would be, were it not for the fact that Boaz was completely honorable. So they've been threshing the grain. Boaz has had a, a meal, probably had a couple of drinks. He's lying on the threshing floor, and Ruth creeps up, and she lies down at his feet, and he wakes up at a start. What's going on? Who are you? And Ruth makes her intentions really clear. And again, we'll look at this next week a bit more. But she says, you are are a guardian redeemer of our family, which is as good as saying, will you marry me and take care of me and my mother-in-law? Pretty bold. And Boaz responds with humility, respect, and integrity. Look what he says. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor, so uh, Boaz was an older man. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Remember that Boaz is a type of Christ and Naomi is a type of the church. Boaz sought to protect and provide for Naomi. And ultimately, he sought to completely change her status by redeeming her through marriage. So Boaz changed Ruth's status, and we'll see next week, from poor, vulnerable widow to wealthy, protected wife. We seek refuge in Christ, our great Redeemer, who changes our status from condemned sinner to forgiven child of God. Jesus loves us. He gave himself up for us. He died for us. And he longs for us to come under his protection. And if you doubt this uh, analogy between Boaz and his future wife Ruth and Christ and the church, listen to Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. There's that analogy between Christ and the church. The same thing we're seeing between Boaz, Ruth. Boaz had the heart of a loving father. How much more so Christ? Boaz sought to protect the vulnerable. 
how much more so Christ? Boaz was generous, how much more so Christ, who spent his life in order that we might be redeemed? Every human being is vulnerable. We're vulnerable to temptation, to sin, and to death, and we're vulnerable in all kinds of other ways as well. We must continue to seek refuge in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, often we don't want to recognize our vulnerabilities. We want to do everything on our own, in our own strength. But we recognize that we need you as our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer. We need you to help us through the trials and the difficulties of life. We need to take refuge in you in both the hard times and the good times. We pray that uh, that'll be our mindset, that we always look to you, that we always seek refuge in you, and we will always, always trust you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to have a, a time of prayer. And there's no one to come and lead the prayers, so the prayers are going to be led by us. Um, There's a limitless number of things that we could be praying for at the moment or any other time. So I'll start off the prayer. Um, I'll leave space for some silence. And then if you'd like to pray, raise your hand. And as as per usual, um, you can either take the mic and pray a succinct prayer or you can just tell me what it is you want to pray for and I'll pray for that so let's just um, turn to the God in pr- turn to God in prayer now Heavenly Father we thank you that you are here with us we thank you that you hear our prayers and that you're always attentive to our prayers and Lord we well there's so much going on in our hearts and our minds We pray that we can really continue to order our priorities in such a way that you are absolutely at the forefront and at the center of our lives. Father, we know that you have a plan and a purpose for each one of us and for this church. And we pray that we'll continue to to realize that through our obedience and our commitment to following your son, Jesus. And we ask that in his name. Amen. So if you have something on your heart that you'd like to pray for, um, raise your hand and you can pray or you can just tell me what it is and I'll pray for it. So Heavenly Father, we lift up Alexandra and Agnes and the whole family in the wake of the death of her nephew, Dendai. Father, our hearts go out to this family and we pray that your peace and your comfort will rest on them. We pray, Father, that even in the midst of this this pain and this awful situation they're grieving in amongst all that they will they will know your presence they will know that you're with them and father we pray for the for the funeral on thursday for your blessing upon the whole family we ask this in jesus name amen Heavenly Father, we want to lift Geraldine up to you, who have been suffering with her back, collapsed discs, and now trapped nerves on both sides. It's incredibly painful. We pray, Father, that you bring relief. We pray, Lord, that you bring healing. We pray that Geraldine will be able to enjoy life to the full without this, this terrible pain and discomfort. We pray that you'll be with Dennis and Geraldine at this time in a very tangible way. And we ask this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Heavenly Father, we uh, lift up all those who are, have, have left school, who are starting on a new phase of their lives, and we think about those who are you know, going to, do, um, to take part in schoolies, and we pray, Father, for safety for those young people. We thank you for those who uh, go out onto the streets to minister to them. We pray that you'll speak uh, through those people, that there'll be a, a, a good influence on the young people and all that's happening. But we pray uh, for safety and we pray for your hand to be upon all those in this church and elsewhere who are leaving school and uh, going on to this next phase of life. Uh, we pray for Bethany that you give her a sense of uh, excitement as to what the future holds and a desire to walk that path that you have set before. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Father God, I just pray as the heart of Boaz went out to Ruth, Father, that the heart of this church would go out uh, to the local community, Father. I pray, Father, that everyone here will feel in their hearts to reach out to those that are around them uh, in their workplaces, in their families, in the society that we live in, and to further afield to places like the Youth Detention Centre and whoever we would come across. Father, I pray that your spirit would go out from this church and would reach those that are out in the community, Father, and touch people's lives, just as Boaz touched the life of Ruth and Naomi. Heavenly Father, we pray for uh, Isabella's baby cousin, and we pray that you will watch over his life, that he will grow to know and love you and to serve you, that he'll have a, a rich and fruitful life, a fulfilling life. And we pray, Lord, that he'll be uh, empowered by your spirit to be a powerful force for good in the world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we lift all of these prayers up to you. And I know that there's many things on people's hearts that maybe they've not um, been able to speak out today. But we pray, Lord, that uh, you continue to, uh, to watch over this church, over, the, over our people and those that we love. And we pray, Father, that we continue to grow uh, to be more like your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. And we'll continue in prayer now with the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 